How's it going? Well, as you may know that we are officially moved into the uh, studio here at uh, the new library and MCAT's new location on the southeast side. Yes, I had to remember all this before I came on for this. I have a short-term memory, so I have to really remember this. But yeah, we are in the southeast side of the new library, 455 Main Street. New location, new fun. And let's uh, dive right into some old and some news and some plenty of fun clips for you guys to enjoy. Kicking things off, uh, hey guys, last week uh, we hosted Missoula Gibbs and they met their goal by uh, an extra 20%. They raised over $1 million of their goal uh, in an event that took place in the MCAT studio last Thursday and Friday. Missoula gave us many videos that reflected everything nonprofit uh, in Missoula. Missoula Community Foundation stayed late into the hours to get the word out and met their $1 million goal and beyond. Which basically means you can make a million dollar program at our station. Think about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, in other news, uh, Georgia is on another path this week. Uh, Republican Governor uh, Brian Kemp overhauled a vague law that allowed for citizens' arrest. Uh, this is as a result of Ahmoud, uh, Ahmad Arberry, who was shot and killed when jogging in a park, and uh, three men uh, started following him, and then a confrontation escalated into the uh, killing and execution of Aubrey. Uh, the former law uh, closed some loopholes and included language for shoplifters, dine and dashers, situations would protect citizens' intervention when approaching apprehending criminals. Most of this has to do a lot with uh, kind of uh, uh, Good Samaritan laws, where they're mostly protective of people who do the right thing. Montana also has this kind of protective law as well. So if you're giving somebody um, the Heimlich maneuver and you break their ribs, uh, the statue basically says is that you can't be sued for saving their life, even though you did hurt them along the way. So there's a lot of uh, vagueness when it comes to this. Let's go back to the kind of like the background. In Arbery's case, he was running and was pursued and fatally shot while jogging near uh, Burnswick in Glen County, Georgia. Arbery, Arbery, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, had been uh, pursued by three white residents, Travis McMichael and his father, Gregory, who are armed and driving a pickup truck with a second vehicle uh, ridden by William Bryan, who followed Arbery in a second vehicle. Um, he was confronted and fatally shot by Travis McMichael. The men believed, since Arbery was running, must have been running from a crime he committed. But there was no evidence proving that this thing happened. And also, uh, luckily, but this is not a right thing to say, there was video surveillance of the confrontation and the shooting. Uh, this is one of the slowest forms of justice because the, by the time uh, the timetable was very wide in the investigation and the um, arrest of these individuals. So it started on the February 23rd attack, and the department shifted the case more than four times before Gregory, uh, let's see, Gregory uh, uh, McMichael, a local attorney, provided a copy of the video of the shooting to local radio station WGIG, who posted it in their website on May 5th, and soon after, the video went viral. On May 7th, they, stayed, they started to arrest the parties involved. They were walking around free from February to May of last year. So far, Georgia passed another bipartisan law that would target hate crimes in Georgia. It was named after Arbery. Um, we're on the age of cameras and surveillance, which makes it easy to get unedited justice if only the body, police body cams can be more available. That offhand comment was made by <laughs> me only. It doesn't represent uh, MCAT or uh, Spectrum or the... Uh, or a cable company that we represent. Another big story happened over the week was a hack by the group Darkside, which hacked a system that transported uh, the, the gasoline pipeline on the East Coast, which resulted in higher prices and some gas shortages on the South uh, East Coast. Uh, the FBI confirmed that Darkside had Eastern European roots and had been ticketed as the um, source of ransomware. So if you want to know what ransomware is, it's where hackers take go on a major corporation, uh, find data, and then hold that data for ransom. Uh, otherwise, they release it to the public, which could affect their businesses and practices. Um, on December 7th, 2020, a few days before the uh, 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 Trojaned uh, SolarWinds software was publicly confirmed to have been used to attack other organizations. Longstanding SolarWinds CEO Kevin Thompson retired. That same day, two private equity firms with the ties to SolarWinds bold sold substantial amounts of stock in SolarWinds. The firm denies insider trading. 
we're at a very tense time and any time there's a transition of power, there's also a transition of information which uh, has a tendency to be loose and it's easy for a lot of people to scoop up. So that's something that is uh, hopefully gonna be worked on in the future. Um, another article, um, and this has to do with the impact of the COVID to businesses here in Missoula. I read this in an article in the Missoula Current, and they uh, focused on Montgomery Distillery, uh, but the pandemic didn't force many businesses to close permanently. According to the Downtown Missoula Partnership, 21 new businesses opened in downtown in 2020, uh, while 10 closed. Only one of those closures was attributed to the pandemic. Uh, the Paycheck Program, aka the PPP, was used to help businesses stay afloat, and in some cases, maybe some of the new businesses were able to um, use some of these payment programs to sustain their business, their new business as well. But that's just speculation at this point. Uh, the statewide unemployment rate fell to 3.8 percent in March, while in Missoula, it's at 4.4 percent unemployment. Um, and just a, kind of like an anecdote, one of my roommates uh, works at a local restaurant here in town making a minimum wage, and he said that we could have made, he could have made uh, more through unemployment uh, during these times than he would have done during his job. So the article highlighted Montgomery Distillery, like I said, because when the pandemic hit, they could not drive through or pick up orders. They, uh, their distillery, they distilled hard liquor, and so there was a lot of ruling in terms of being able to actually buy bottles of liquor from them and taking them out. Uh, a lot of times these places only have the option to do it on location. So what they ended up doing is got a little more creative and basically turned all their uh, efforts for, to, uh, from making liquor to making hand sanitizer. And at the time it was the perfect, uh, perfect scheme basically because uh, there was a lot of uh, shortages when it came to uh, hand sanitizer because people thought that hand sanitizers were the key to preventing the spread of COVID. And I don't know if that actually was, you just look at the evidence. Um, <laughs> Uh, I apologize. I probably shouldn't laugh. Forget I said. Forget I said that. But, anyways, the, this was a very good note. And uh, so far, uh, uh, from this article, um, it seems like Missoula has been getting calls for the last six six weeks about new business opportunities moving here to Missoula. So Missoula is back, baby. And speaking of back, the new mask mandate recommendation, uh, which was originally a mask mandate, became a recommendation this week. On Monday, uh, the health board met and released, released a press release basically recommending that masks uh, should be uh, recommendations. Some businesses can recommend people wear a mask, but, you, uh, but um, in Missoula, you can't enforce a mask measure. So if people wanted to go to a place and not wear a mask, you can't tell them to wear a mask. Uh, and you know, that's kind of like what it's matching with the rest of the state of Montana, because as soon as uh, great, uh, Governor Greg Gianforte repealed the mask mandate, most of the other communities in Montana also repealed their mask mandate. But there are a couple other places that can keep it going because they are tied uh, with the federal government, which include the TSA, the Transportation Service Administration, uh, which is uh, the mountain line bus system, which is uh, federally regulated. So if you ride a city bus, you have to wear a mask because it's still uh, federally mandate mask wearing, which also includes schools and public schools and whatnot. All right, so uh, the library will continue to uh, ask that people still wear a mask and be uh, polite to folks, but they've already been a couple people here this week not wearing a mask. And honestly, it's not that big of a deal to me uh, because I've been vaccinated and all that stuff. But usually if somebody gets too close, I just ask them to give me some space. Not because they're not wearing a mask, mostly because they're really close. And that happened to me the other day. So up next, we have a library virtual tour to get a sense of what the library is really like and more. So stay with me. Up next, we'll have Pre-Critic. Hello, and welcome to a virtual tour of the new Missoula Public Library building, home to Missoula Public Library, University of Montana Spectrum Discovery Area, Families First Learning Lab, and MCAT Community Media Resource. I'm Tracy Lesneski, Principal with MSR Design, the design architects for the project. We, along with our local partner A&E, are delighted to have had the honor of designing this new community hub for the region. Working in the Missoula Valley was an inspiration to our team and informed the building's form and materiality. The ever-changing valley weather and its impact on light and color influenced the exterior cladding choice, 
which reflects the sky and surrounding light and colors, rendering it as changeable as the valley weather. Large expanses of glass offer views into the activities inside the building, bring ample daylight in, and connect people inside to the city, campus, Mount Sentinel, and Mount Jumbo, reinforcing the building's place in the community it serves. Immediately upon entering, we're in the active heart of the building, known as the Marketplace. From the entry, one immediately gets oriented to the building via views all the way through to the south and encounters for the first time an important wayfinding feature, the main stair and building core. Wrapped in wood and containing the stair, elevator, and toilet rooms, this core is key to orientation and wayfinding as one moves throughout the building. The wood adds warmth to each floor and serves as a visual cue. The main level is vibrant and active, providing spaces to meet and interact, make things, and experiment with technology and media. This level is also home to the Trapper Peak Coffee Shop, which includes an outdoor patio for those fine days. The Marketplace Zone includes display of new books and media, and a retail shop with offerings from each building partner available for purchase. The maker space opens onto the marketplace so exciting makerly activities can spill out. Youths have a special destination on this floor with the teen space and a National Institute of Health SEPA supported living lab. Building partner MCAT is located on this floor complete with equipment checkout, small to sound booths, places to create and edit audio and video content, and access to its high-tech production studio and talented staff. A large workroom for library staff on this floor is complemented by the automated materials handling system, which greatly improves the speed with which materials can get checked in and sorted for reshelving. This frees up valuable staff time for other critical aspects of public service, and with an expanded building size but the same number of staff, that efficiency is very important. The color theme and forms throughout the building used the metaphor of a mountain climb for each floor of the building. The local bitterroot flower inspired the pink accents on level two. This floor is all about children, families, and learning through play. It is home to the Harrington Children's Library, Family's First Learning Lab, and University of Montana's Spectrum Discovery Area. Daylight filled and organized by age group, level two has places to collaborate and play together as well as quiet nooks for reading alone and rooms for school-aged children to study. The Water Room, a collaboration between Spectrum, Families First, and Clark Fork Coalition, is an exciting hands-on opportunity to learn about water and the water cycle. This floor also boasts interactive play fixtures designed to allow the imagination to run free. Located near these fixtures is the Imaginarium Storytelling Space, this room can open all the way up to the children's library for larger programs or expanded play and learning space. Conveniently located toilet rooms and a comfort room, which is a space that can be used for breastfeeding or calming a child, are part of the main building core. And regular library users will be delighted to see that the Gnome House lives on. Building Partner Families First Learning Lab has its home on this floor as well complete with a comfortable reception area, private consultation rooms, and a classroom. Ensuring that the building is long-lasting, flexible, and sustainable was a primary project driver. The design includes a mechanical system utilizing hydrothermal energy and a raised floor with underfloor air distribution system. This system minimizes energy use and delivers fresh air at the user level. The raised floor also supports long-term flexibility. The Payne family floor on level three features the fiction and non-fiction collections, reference services, and a variety of reading areas and learning spaces. The demonstration kitchen space is a great opportunity to see our built-in flexibility in action. This room is designed for demonstration cooking and also for use as a study area, a meeting room, or just a place to enjoy the view to Mount Sentinel while paging through books on cooking and nutrition. This floor provides many kinds of seating and study spaces 
and is a place where one can find quiet in this new library building, in study nooks and enclosed bookable study rooms. The Montana Room, which contains genealogy resources and the library's historical research collection, occupies a special corner on this floor and is accented in wood. This floor also contains a business center with laptop lending, printers, business resources, and a collaboration pod. Our design deliberately minimizes the use of interior finishes to essential, performative, and beautiful surfaces to conserve natural resources, while also ensuring that what people touch and interact with is warm and inviting, such as the handrail of the main stair or the sound absorptive textiles on the study room walls. There are plenty of comfortable seats with lovely daylight and views to the exterior surroundings. We took particular care to provide public views to Mount Jumbo when we learned of the elk migration that takes place there each year. Level 4 is the airy summit of our figurative mountain climb and is devoted to public engagement and community gathering. This level features flexible state-of-the-art meeting rooms and inspiring views and the Cooper's Space Event Center. Upon entering this floor, one encounters the pre-function space, which supports events, receptions, and gatherings and provides spectacular views to the north and south. The south side of the floor offers access to an exterior patio overlooking Mount Sentinel and the city. A reception lounge offers convenient catering access and also space to have a meeting or to study. Another lounge on the north side of the floor doubles as a staff service point, a check-in area for events, or is just a lovely spot to meet with someone or relax and enjoy the view. The Blackfoot boardroom occupies a special corner of the building with full height glass that makes one feel as though they are sitting in the mountains. This flexibility ensures that the new Missoula Public Library will be a useful and flexible tool in support of the community's civic gathering, programming, and event needs. Thank you for the opportunity to show you the new library building. We are excited to see the building activated with people engaged in learning and discovery in myriad ways, people gathering and socializing, and putting this new public amenity to work. Definitely used in a little more natural light from the outside. Uh, kind of putting this together last minute because I have a long day today here at MCAT. But let's talk about some Castlevania. Uh, it is pre-critic time and Castlevania season four. Hey, who knew it would last this long? But hey, this is probably one of the more popular video game franchises out there. Wrapping up the series that glorifies violence uh, through an old 8-bit lens comes Castlevania season four, uh, AKA the final season which sees many evil devil stuff trying to bring back Dracula, uh, since, you know, spoiler alert, he died like in the first two seasons, and have some laughs along the way. Um, I've been looking forward to this series for some time now, but I'm pretty sure they're just gonna be like, fighting, 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 and then they work their way up to the, like the final boss, but then it turns out the final boss wasn't actually the final boss, and then the real final boss, uh, it's Dracula who comes back, because it always has to be Dracula as the last boss. Up next, uh, Love, Death, and Robots. Yes, this, uh, today, it just dropped up on Netflix. I'm basically talking about Netflix because all the movies I talked about last week are coming out this week. Love, Death, and Robots, or as I like to call it, uh, balls, sex, and nudity, the animation. Uh, <laughs> Rule 34, eat your heart out, because this has a plot, like a lot of plots. Uh, anthology series are good only because you don't have to see the same people again and again and again and again, <laughs> watch as they dive into sci-fi and ask yourself, sex with it? I watched the first season and all I can say is ambitious, looks like Spider-Verse, nudity. Um, <laughs> uh, I, it's definitely not safe for work, but I watched the first season and all I can say is, uh, yeah, all that stuff. Cutscenes from various video games uh, and plenty of laughs regardless of horrifying images. Anyways, this is a showcase of short animated films that looks 
at love, death, and robots, um, and people just kind of stretching the uh, meaning of those terms. But uh, what else do you need? Maybe a uh, heavy metal uh, sequel that's not Heavy Metal 2000? But we do have a new video game that's coming out, and it's uh, part of the Subnautica series. It's Subnautica Below Zero. Hey, you know, What's better than a survival, uh, Minecrafty type of uh, 3D virtual reality game? Well, why didn't you just throw winter in there and just make yourself suffer even more? Uh, it's Arctic winter. We're talking about Subnautica below zero. If you thought a vast ocean was tough, let's throw it in some winter. Welcome to my nightmare, wet, cold, and have to figure out uh, that putting coral reefs together somehow makes fuel, then food, and then kill some animals to make more things that you can make more fuel stuff and repair your sh spaceship, which is also a submarine. I don't know. If you don't do the thing for the hundredth time, you die. If you don't do the uh, other thing for the hundredth time, you die. If you want to play a survival hole, which is more chore than gameplay, <coughs> Animal Crossing. Uh, but hey, you can always get a coat made of uh, dead baby seals. All options are about the same in these games. All right, so that does it for pre-critic. Up next, we got a brand new dubbing stuff from the makers of Zontar. Um, here is dubbing stuff. Oh man, no more red shirts with a black stripe. Oh, uh, who is it? Group service, just checking in All early. All right, just show yourself in. Sorry to bother you, but we just brewed a fresh pot of coffee, and I just wanted to show you. Hmm, thanks, but that looks more like water, but hey, uh -huh. I guess you can brew water. Yeah, it's great. Listen, I'm from America. Good for you. And I'm just trying to find out, you know, a places to go, but I can't read the signs. I walked into a store thinking it was a bar, and then it was like... Oh, everyone makes that mistake. It's both. I can get a beer at a post office in this town? Well, maybe perhaps we could get a beer. If you're not too busy looking for a particular shirt... Wait a minute, I don't remember saying that to you. Oops. Were you listening to me while I was unpacking white shirts I will never wear but somehow keep in there for some reason for aesthetics? Well, you were talking so loud by yourself. Can a man confront his demons in private? And I'm bored. Oh, okay then. Well, I'll just, you know, mind my own business. But, you know, maybe you should learn to mind your own business. Well, my parents run this hotel, so it is my business. Oh, well, yeah, I guess so. By the way, were you hitting on me earlier? I don't know. Yeah, you were hitting on me. You were asking me if I want to go to the uh, post office bar with you. Well, it is a great way to write a postcard and get drunk and write another postcard to people that you might think you don't want to write a postcard to. But you think to yourself, hey, maybe they'll be jealous. Now, who do you think I would write a postcard to? You don't honestly believe I know people. Well, don't expect me to know what you know, because I don't know. Well, it's not about who I know. It's more about what I know. And I know trampolines. And I can tell you everything from top to bottom, how a trampoline works, from the springs to the uh, felt on the front that you bounce on. When I was but a small boy, I uh, was given a gift of a trampoline by my mother. Will this take long? Well, uh, um, I have a point for this story. But it takes a lot of context to understand where I'm coming from. So would you mind listening to what I have to say? Um... Well, I didn't hear no, so let me explain a little bit. When my father got home, he was furious at me for having a trampoline. He said, I can't have a trampoline. I don't know why your mother got a trampoline. I'm the one that puts roof over your head. So, oh, God, oh, God, is he yeah. just going to talk, talk about trampolines forever? Maybe I should just, just, it's only just a nod and, and really nod listen to him politely. We have to get this back so we can get the full refund. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. How did that happen? Well, actually, it's a pretty funny story now that you ask. One story at a time. And so that's when he decided to talk a little bit more about my mom. Returning the trampoline, trampoline rather than, rather than talking, talking about, about his, his relationship with his father. To a manager, and then if that manager didn't say yes, he'd go up to the next manager. I'm going to die of this. Well, needless to say, my dad got his money back, and uh, I've been obsessed with trampolines ever since. You know, it's always kind of like the thing that you want, but is never given to you. The it grass is always greener on the other side. Well, that's what I've been told. I don't think this is applicable in this situation, but I can empathize with you wanting to do something and not getting what you want. You look tired. Perhaps you might want to um, go to bed and rest up for a bit. I gotta go. I didn't get to the punchline. This story doesn't have a punchline. This is just a really boring story about your origins of becoming a trampoline salesman. And you haven't heard the best part the yet. The best part is after it's over. Uh, 
you really think that about me? Well, when everyone puts a and then in their story... Well, how else am I going to have a through line? You end one sentence and start another. I don't know. That seems kind of impossible to do. How do you do it? Well, um... Um... Words? Other things? I don't know what to say to you. And now you know how to talk to someone in the service industry. Oh, hold on. Let me get the door for you. Um... But, yeah, if you get off work, maybe we can... No. Okay. Great. I... I'll... Ah, darn it. Hey guys, welcome back. We are here to talk a little bit about some city council stuff. So let's gonna dive right in. It's the public hearing on rezoning up River Road. Um, so part of this is that they want to uh, change some of the uh, settings to basically allow for more property. And so far, uh, they want to uh, convert a four home property into allowing about eight, adding about three more, nothing that big, but here is uh, Dave DeGrandpe, DeGrandpre, uh, he's a rep for the developer and this is what he has to say. Um, the board felt that, that this level of zoning, this zone change, you know, it's an incremental increase and provides some assurance to neighbors about future development due to the limited scope and scale of the zone change. Uh, the board members, at least one mentioned that the possibility of three new homes is reasonable, uh, wouldn't be a, a, a drastic change, um, the connection to city water and sewer upon redevelopment or at some point in the future would be beneficial. Also, that this this rezoning would allow an increased density and not um, not beyond undeveloped farmland, which some of the members thought that was that was important. And then also, you know, there was some back and forth and discussion about what would prompt connection to city services, what would prompt street improvements and those sorts of things. But I think the board was generally satisfied uh, with the proposal in its scope and scale. As you saw, you know, they, they, they may only add three or homes in this place on the property. This is kind of like uh, what a lot of times they do is that a property owner wants to develop on the property and be like, hey, I want to add some more homes, but it's only zoned for this. Let's talk about this. So Paul Forstein with iMake uh, Architecture talks about what they plan to do with this site. I think it's, it's not an architect, I think it's a developer. So this is Paul. This is an infill project that we're excited about. Um, we don't have grand plans necessarily for how, how the site's going to be developed. Um, I'm here today with Josh Eater. He's the property owner. Um, he's actually selling the property. And so he's he, the person he's selling it to is gonna start by remodeling the two back units. Um, by back, I mean furthest to the south and then potentially work forward. Um, but ultimately I think they will add three units getting the total count to seven if the zoning is approved. Um, they, anytime the, it, whenever this site is developed uh, or when development occurs on the site, water, sewer, roads, um, those type of things will have to be evaluated and installed, designed. Um, Josh and I haven't done that yet, um, so we don't have any type of plans, but I, I, I know that it's tight site and so those things will have to be um, done with care and in, in accordance with the city's rules. Um, Nothing too big, but the wheels of the city keep on turning. Uh, they are going to talk a little bit more about the cash and move geared towards crowdsourcing funding for parks. Part of the uh, 2019 urban open space plan, the city reflects a desire for more parks in a growing Missoula. Um, and when you develop a neighborhood, they want to hopefully help uh, cultivate uh, interest in creating parks and parkland. So the goal is to basically be able to uh, have people walk for about no more than 10 minutes so they can enjoy some natural, uh, beautiful park land and stuff, whether it be open space, natural parks, or more of your typical park you'd see in the city. Jordan Hess, city council, who's been a champion this uh, Cash and Lou program, talks a little bit more about it. Cash and Lou is um, not perfect. It is a tool um, to get um, to get money when um, parkland dedication isn't um, the most appropriate thing. Um, and um, the city's used it well over, over the last several decades, but um, there is additional work to um, amend this, um, this tool um, and to really uh, make it the strongest um, 
tool with the best community interest that we have. But in the meantime, I think that this is a good amendment and, um, and I support it. Of course, you know, uh, requesting developers to build a park along with the housing development, this would make it easier uh, to work with developers, especially when the city agrees to pay. Um, part of this amendment would also include ways to uh, get an appraisal for potential parks. Uh, Julie Marriott, uh, city council is against this, and this is what she had to say. I, th I think that we could have approached it better with the development com community and, and gotten some more buy-in from them. I know that there have been um, a lot of great conversations among staff and the development community uh, that, that are really moving things along in other areas. And, and I hope that in the future that um, the same will happen in this arena, um, but I'm not gonna be able to support this tonight. Thanks. The timeline in Cash and Lou can be a little tricky because some developers may not be interested in pooling resources with the cost being covered after the project without the kind of guarantee. It's kind of like uh, making a small bond for the area. It really seems like a post payment plan for some projects. Uh, Amber Sherrill, City Council, speaks more about the concern for Cash and Lou. One thing that I've always worried about is the fact that, you know, we're putting the money in a, in a pot, right? And then we don't spend it immediately. And our property values are already changing quite rapidly as we see. So if we say we can, you know, if we push it off three years and then it's in a pot of money, I just think that it's, it's not going to be, it's too far out and there's too many unknowns about property values at that point for me to support that. And so far, uh, having money put aside for small projects can be an issue without the foresight to use it for projects. It's like paying for a project that is unclear with intention, but the motive is clear. Um, this all has to do with the Missoulians want for parkland, which started with the 2004 open space bond. And uh, they want to continue uh, seeing fi and figuring out ways the best uh, to uh, have more parks, especially in uh, budding neighborhoods that seem to be popping up. Up next, uh, we got some Parkinson Conservation. They talked a little bit more about that ordinance, uh, looking into permitting the amplification for parks. And so far, this is more discussion than action. And so one of the biggest complaints from this has to do with Bluetooth speakers and just people like, imagine people like way back in the day, bringing a boom box and hanging out with their friends, playing music, playing some volleyball at Kiwanis Park. And uh, you know, you're, you're in a residential area and you can only be so loud. But then again, uh, there's, uh, they want to make sure that there's some kind of permit associated with amplification of noise at the park. Just so like if you have a, a, a band and you want to set up something up and you don't want a neighbor calling the cops on you, then they want to be able to close a loophole in which you can get a permit uh, regardless of asking uh, the neighborhood if it's okay to play in a public park. So that is the good part of it. But the um, Bad part of it is that some people who just want to pull out a guitar and uh, basically be John Mayer in the middle of a park are really concerned about being able to do that. So they're going to see a lot of interesting uh, people as well uh, um, and musicians uh, looking to uh, see how the city plans on fixing this. Uh, now let's talk about some public works. I usually don't talk about this because they usually talk about laying pipe and mostly talking about uh, some infrastructure for the water main system. But they're talking about a ditch in which uh, the city is going to acquire from an irrigation company. Uh, so th this is the Mullen Roads drainage ditch is looking a little bit tricky, especially when you're developing infrastructure in this area. And this is looking like it's going to cost uh, about $990,000, Public Works and Mobility staff are able to negotiate an agreement with, to acquire the rights to the ditch and convert an existing user to irrigation wells rather than making expensive infrastructure investments that would uh, perpetuate the ditch. The ditch actually started uh, starts up by the Clark Fork River. This is actually news to me because it starts at uh, where Imagination Brewing Company is near the Pav, and there's like a little throughway for the river to go through, and the drainage just kind of go, goes along underneath um, until it reaches Mullen Road, in which you see the water go all the way past Mullen and then up through some of the uh, developments as well. And it was used for uh, irrigation for the farmland that was up there. And the Mullen area, especially George Elmer and uh, I uh, believe uh, the Flynn Lane development that's being proposed and developed right now is there's not much farmland that's actually being farmed and it's uh, getting to be uh, less um, necessary to have a, a lot of that irrigation. So the company, uh, this is, uh, which 
is owned by, let me just double check this, is um, Hellgate Valley Ir Irrigation Company it is working with uh, the city of Missoula to work out a deal to uh, get acquirement to this as well. So German Keen, the new Missoula Developmental Services, who's also kind of like the champion for the new Mullen uh, neighborhood area, uh, it talks a little bit more about the process. So the so the accepted offer that uh, we worked out with the, with the Hellgate Valley Irrigation Company, um, which is contingent on council approval and um, allows for due diligence and some fundraising to occur over the next six months, um, it, it establishes a price to acquire the rights to the ditch. It converts existing dis ditch users to irrigation wells. So this is a, a more reliable way of getting water to those properties that are still irrigating. Um, and those those water rights would be converted to um, to use for, for groundwater for wells. And, and there's also compensation in the agreement for uh, the folks that have water rights but are no longer using those water rights. And so far it is looking good, but we'll take a near million dollar chunk from the build grant and or other infrastructure of funding sources that the city is using to put into this new neighborhood. Uh, for six months, they will look into this and funding with final approval, late, final approval later down the pipe. Here's Jeremy Keen once again. We think there's some other opportunities that could come out of this too. Um, the ditch encumbers land that could be used for housing. Um, there are areas where uh, the city owns land underlying the ditch that could be used for park or green space. There are opportunities for stormwater management and possibly trail connectivity that could come out of this. So there's a number of other projects that can follow on this acquisition. Our focus right now is just doing our due diligence and getting the funds together to, to acquire the ditch. And if that's successful, then there are other future uh, capital projects that could happen um, that, that acquiring the ditch provides that opportunity. And about 720, uh, 20, uh, so like you said, it's 725,000 of the 990 will look towards transportation impact fees and water utility development fund, which exists because of the water company's acquisition, uh, which is the water utility. This is a very well put together presentation, which has a lot of potential for land value and potential fisheries. Jeremy says that the $1 million cost would equal $2 million benefit for the community. It's also rare for an irrigation company or a Hellgate Valley Irrigation Company to be willing to work with the city in creating this collaboration. And so far, that's what you, uh, what's happening here in the city of Missoula. It may not seem that interesting, but there's a lot of changes that are happening as we're growing, and the need for water is going to be a lot more uh, necessary as our population grows. Yes, we are lucky to have our own aquifer in Missoula County, but it doesn't excuse the fact that we are having a growing population in which we need good uh, infrastructure to uh, drink the water, to make sure it's clean, and also uh, separate the storm water, which is usually associated with the water runoff, wastewater, and all that stuff. So there's a lot of happening here, and we're just trying to get the infrastructure ready for it. But if you're interested in learning more about the city of Missoula, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. And that about does it for my city council report. Uh, up next, uh, we are talking about your events. Yes, I'm bringing back the, back the events. In COVID times, it's really rare for people to be wanting or willing to do a lot of things out and about, but I found a couple great events that are happening that you can do on your own or with your core group of people that you've uh, bunkered down with during these times. Uh, bike month. So May is bike month and uh, Surveys show only about 27% of adults and 44% of children riding bicycles actually wear their helmets. So St. Pat is doing a bicycle helmet buy for $8. It's cheap bicycle helmets. They encourage people to wear a bicycle helmet because a cracked helmet is better than a cracked skull. Um, and part of these bike uh, during the uh, bike month is that you have a whole bunch of self-guided tours and you got art and trees by bike, this bicycle around downtown. And this is a starting point at Pine Street and Woody. And you start at the park and you go around some of the, uh, the trails that happen to be around here leading up to uh, uh, free cycles at the end. And also they are uh, uh, saying that a good chance at the UM uh, campus, Arbor Arbortum, uh, sorry, Arbortum, 
I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, but it's the science, uh, this the study of trees. But uh, Arbor, so the Bike Month blooms in the University of Montana campus while exploring the state of Montana's trees. The University of Montana campus is free of traffic and full of beautiful trees, wide sidewalks. Um, go for a ride and take the loved one on a cel uh, and, and celebrate spring. Take your mom on a bicycle ride for Mother's Day. Uh, pay parking is available at the Van Buren uh, Campus Drive parking lot, or you can ride over to the campus on your bicycles using the lovely Riverfront Trail. Library hours? Hey, let's talk about some library hours. As we're moving into the weekends, uh, one of the things is that Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., they're letting in the public on different days to enjoy the new library. There is about an hour uh, per 100 people. So if you come in here, you can only be in here for about an hour, and then you have to rotate and keep doing that. That's kind of what the library is doing as they're trying to expose a lot of people to be able to use the library resources, but only as a kind of a drive-through drive kind of service in and out kind of deal. And MCT, if you haven't um, known, is that they have been uh, performing, but they've been doing virtual uh, stream of Betty Lou and the Country Beast, which is an original MCT children's show. Until May 31st, you guys can go online, buy tickets, and watch the stream of Betty Lou and the Ca uh, Country Beast. Um, at a local fair, young Beauty Lou is upset by an ungrateful behavior of a minor who has won the blue ribbon for his beautiful roses. And as a result, she calls him a beast and wishes that he would look like one too. And yes, he becomes a beast. And then years later, when in danger of losing the family farm, Betty Lou agrees to befriend the beast to save her family. Well, 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 look who comes crawling back, as the beast would say. <laughs> That's my own spin on it, but uh, you can look, uh, so the point of this is to look beyond appearances and first impression to see the beauty that dwells inside. Um, and that's kind of what's happening until May 31st. But hey, uh, Downtown Transfer Center, uh, starting at 11 a.m. today, if you uh, miss it. But they're doing a uh, uh, learn how to put your bike on the bus. Usually, when you have a bike, they have a rack in the front to put your bike on when they're driving you around town. A nice additive bonus for a very bike-friendly town that is Missoula. And so they're going to teach you that at the uh, Mountain Line Transfer Center, which is at 200 West Pine Street. It's with all the buses. You can't miss it. Um, it starts at 11. Missoula Friday Night Mountain uh, Friday Night Mountain Bike League. So Marshall Mountain is hosting uh, bike events that do some uh, mountain biking uh, on the trail. Uh, they have the, uh, Marshall Mountains kind of on, on a distance away, but this is great for a lot of different people. And bike events in the, are at the traditional Marshall Mountain in Missoula, MTB Missoula, MT Alpha, and now. MTCX have put all put in a weekday mountain bike series over the last six years, and this year is more of the league format. All abilities welcome and more events into early May. This pairs uh, perfectly with the celebration of Bike Month. Six weeks of racing every Friday night at Marshall Mountain, lots of categories and different courses every week. Challenge, challenge yourself on difficult courses against the best riders in your category. Nine to 12 year olds and high school riders have a special start around 3.30 every week and there's option clink on the uh, course Thursday nights at 6.45. Have fun and be safe, Missoula. International Wildlife Film Festival wraps up uh, tonight uh, for Friday, and that's at 8 p.m., and they're going to be uh, hosting the film. I want to, uh, let's see. They're going to be at Orgren Park, the uh, baseball field, and tonight they're doing a thing on whales. It's called Wild Window, colon, Whales, and that's their last documentary of their International, International Wildlife Film Festival. They've been doing a lot of outdoor events at the Rock State Theater. They have a nice little outdoor pavilion type setup for people to have some social distancing and watch these movies, but also have online virtual stuff. If you're interested, you can go to the International Wildlife Film Festival, Missoula. Rise and shine on hip hop. Monks is starting their hip hop nights back up again this weekend. They have a lot of DJs from Anthony Johnson, Krillhead, Double Deuce, Ty, um, Mitt Ashwell, Traz of the Wiz, Dar, uh, Tons of Fun, and Wormwood. Uh, doors open at 9 p.m. Also, loyalty will be DJing as well. 406, a country band will be playing at the Sunrise Saloon for some live music. Um, Saturday, uh, let's kick some things off for Saturday. And starting Saturdays is the Farmers, Peoples, and Clark Fork River Market. It started in early May and it's going to continue on through the uh, summer and into October. So. 
from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Enjoy some farmer's market fun. Let's see. This next event on Saturday is the uh, Heroes at Home and Veteran Suicide Awareness and Prevention, Rocky Mountain Museum of Military History, the Veteran Support Network, the Veteran Support Network, uh, VSN, a Missoula region was established to provide a network of support for veterans, service members, and their families in the Missoula region, Mineral, uh, Missoula Valley, and Granite Counties. Members of the VSN voluntarily collaborate and meet once a month to network and share resources and services available to meet the needs of our veterans and military community. And yeah, so they're also doing a Here at Home event and Suicide Awareness uh, VSA Run, Walk, Ruck, and this is going to be at Silver Park starting at 10 a.m. And they don't want, they don't, they say uh, you can come at any time, but to support them, you can get groups and you can do a fun run at Silver Park. Let's see. Municipal Public Library is also doing a seed savings with Five Valley Seed Library. So if you're interested in gardening and wanting to start a garden, they have seeds here at the Missoula Public Library. And at 11 a.m. you can uh, uh, join Five Valley Seed Library, volunteer your bond uh, for a Zoom workshop geared towards gardeners who are curious about seed saving but don't know where to start. Home gardeners will learn how to seed saving works, why seed saving techniques vary from different plants, and what info we need to know in order to get the seeds we want. And that's going to be at Missoula Public Library starting at 11 a.m. And also they have online systems in which you can sign up through their website through the MissoulaEvents.net. Let's see, looks like they're doing a live music at Bonner Park that is not the uh, Missoula City Band. Uh, Snap Communication presents live music Da Zoo Boys, the, no, it's called Da Zoo, and it's a bring your own beer kind of situation, live music at Bonner Park starting at 6 p.m. Uh, and they say that nothing over 11% alcohol per city permit. So it's mostly just beer, hangout, uh, and it's featuring DJ Nightwolf serving up your favorite karaoke hits. And you can RSVP by uh, going through the link at MissoulaEvents.net and emailing the person to be on their karaoke. Oh, uh, yes, this is a, another event that's happening at Silver Park on Sunday at 11. It is the third annual Tutu Trot. Wear a tutu and support a 22,000 youth living in Missoula County and run for 2.2 miles. Rather than holding an official start time, they're going to do it from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And you can run the 2 mile, 2.2 miles or walk it or get your group going on there so they're looking this fund provides over eighty eight thousand dollars of scholarships to families ensuring every missoula county child is able to access after school and summer club programs boobs yes boobs with erica von kleist uh stephen hoop speakeasy award-winning multi-instrument erica von kleist uh performs at stephen hoops for one night at 7 p.m on sunday her debaucherous one-woman musical comedy show features hilarious original songs covering everything from self-image to menstruation. And of course, boobs. This, <laughs> they really want to emphasize the word boobs. But this show will have you in stitches and the ultimate ladies and guys night out. Show starts at 7 p.m. VIP is $25 and uh, $15 for the cheap sheets. All right, so that about does it for my morning show and events. You can look up MissoulaEvents.net for more information. But for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And this is very weird, especially uh, as we're transitioning back into the MCAT studio.